Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, our first speaker for today. John Branch is a professor of a variety of marketing and international business courses at the Stephen M. Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. Until recently, he also served as Director of Educational Outreach at the University's William Davidson Institute, which focuses on emerging and transitional economies and was responsible for the development and dissemination of pedagogical materials. He has been involved in a variety of European Union and other government-funded development projects, most notably in the republics of the former USSR, including the Ukraine and Uzbekistan. He has consulted to numerous international organizations, including Anheuser-Busch, Mercedes-Benz, Coca-Cola, Michelin, Nestle, and many more. Um, today, his talk will focus on globalization, the great debate. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Branch. Thank you very much, Jamie, and thank you, Meredith, for inviting me over. I'm so delighted to be here. <clears throat> I do have my name tag on here. It says I'm a professor at the University of Michigan, although at so sometimes I feel like I'm teaching kindergarten. You might remember back to your undergraduate days and, and your kindergarten-like behavior. Although I have to tell you that the people who, uh, there's a little bit of an inverse relationship at universities. The people who act out the most are actually the executive MBAs, the 50-year-old uh, CEOs of companies, which is possibly no surprise after some of the talks you heard about yesterday and the uh, men behaving badly and women behaving badly in, in corporations within our globalized world economy. Um, it's really great to be here in Chicago despite having uh, spent the past uh, five years living in St. Louis and being a Car Cardinals fan, but I won't say anything about that. I know better. So Jamie said I am at one of these centers for Russian and Eastern European studies. It's a slightly different acronym, but it's one of the, the number of uh, federally funded, um, federally funded uh, institutes within universities which focus on Eastern Europe and Central, uh, Central Europe and also the former Soviet Union. The reason why I'm there is because my first big international experience when I was 22 years old was a year spent in Poland in 1992, just after the wall had come down in the Solidarność movement in Poland. So what an exciting time to be in Central, Central Europe. The year after, I spent about three months in this town called Bishkek. Anybody know where Bishkek is? Bishkek is the capital of Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan is one of the 15 republics of the former Soviet Union, right? Yes? There were 15 republics in the Soviet Union. Let's name them all. Here we go. Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Ukraine, Georgia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Russian Federation, Russian Federation, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, one more, starts with a B and ends with Russia, Belarus, great, capital cities. So I, um, I'm a professor at the Ross School of Business, the number one business school in the United States. <laughs> Thank you. On cue. And a uh, faculty associate at the Center for Russian and Eastern European Studies. Um, as uh, Jamie suggested, I was also for the past couple of years an administrator at the William Davidson Institute at the university, which focuses on emerging economies, which some of you might know is about 75% of the world classified as an emerging economy, and I was in charge of developing pedagogical materials. So teaching materials, cases, uh, videos, simulations, any kind of teaching material which could be used at the community college level, the secondary school level, or the university level management training, but focusing on emerging economies. Uh, prior to moving to the University of Michigan, I was a professor at Washington University in St. Louis which happens to be in the same conference as the University of Chicago for sports. Um, it's a good one, yeah, <laughs> Division Three. And uh, you can see there I got my PhD at the University of Cambridge in England. I also spent some time at, at Kellogg, which is the Graduate School of Business at Northwestern University. And I was at the University of Oxford for some time, also in England. 
Uh, I guess my claim to fame is I am international guy. That's my business title at, at the University of Michigan. I spend about four... Go blue! I spend about four months of the year traveling the world. I have a visiting professorship at the Moscow State University in Russia, also at the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, Latvia, and at the Zagreb School of Economics and Management in Zagreb, Hrvatia, Croatia. But I'm usually uh, traveling to Europe once or twice a month doing management training and other kinds of teaching. So, internet, international guy I am. And the courses which I teach are largely around globalization, international business, and international marketing. Hence, my presence here. All right? And I'm originally from Canada, if you couldn't tell by my lack of accent. Right? Canadians are neutral in accent. Everybody else's accent is gauged by our neutrality. Okay, so here we go. Today, um, I thought we would start out talking about globalization. Yesterday, I had some very interesting talks, but they were, they were um, not particularly definitional in terms of what globalization is. So we want to start out by talking uh, a little bit about globalization and then move directly into High School Debate Club. Does everybody remember High School Debate Club? Does anybody, did anybody participate in High School Debate Club and is willing to admit it? Okay. Well done. Any chess club members here? No. Dungeons and Dragons? So we're going to do a, a quick little debate. And the reason I want to do the debate is it seems that globalization as a controversial topic is most suited to a classroom exercise around a debate. So we won't do the full debate, which, which I actually use at, in my executive MBA classes and my full-time MBA classes, but we'll do a quickie version of it so you can get a feel for how you might run it in your own classrooms and the kinds of materials which you might use in order to um, facilitate the debate. Then I would like to have a, a broader discussion about why is this thing called globalization so controversial? Why does it raise so much controversy, as we say in England? Right? Why so much controversy around globalization? What are the dimensions of globalization which cause people to get so infuriated about it? Or, conversely, so rah, 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 hip, hip, hooray, globalization is going to save the day. Okay? And finally, I would like to leave you with what I think are the most important dimensions to understand as a teacher, instructor, professor, when you're teaching globalization within a broader framework of economics. Not so much in sociology or anthropology or linguistic studies, but if you're teaching globalization within the broad area of economics, right, economics, then these are what I consider the, the, the four main dimensions of globalization. And we'll leave it at the end there, uh, hopefully with some time for discussion and Q&A. Sound good? Before we get there, I want to do a quick summary from yesterday. So what did you learn at school yesterday, honey? What did you learn at school yesterday, honey? Something interesting that you... Lots of graphs and charts, costs and benefits. A lot about corn? What about corn? They grow a lot of it in Iowa. Great. So one of the things about globalization which you learned through this example is that it's all interconnected, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very, very interwoven activity. So you know the old, if a butterfly flaps its wings in, in uh, the South Pacific, then we have a monsoon in Mumbai, right? the same with globalization. If there is a monsoon in Madagascar, what happens to your vanilla chai latte in the morning? Why? Because 70% because of the world's vanilla is grown on the island of Madagascar. And not just 70% of the world's vanilla, 70% of premium, grade A, the best quality vanilla you can get. The other 30% largely comes from which country? Anybody? Make a run for the border? Mexico. Mexico. So Mexico is the other big producer. If there is any, um, if there is any weather-related crop problems in 
in Madagascar if there is a coup, a military coup, which happens frequently in Southeast Asia, there are any problems in the capital of Madagascar, which is, anybody, capital of Madagascar? Anta, Anta Narivo. If there are military or economic problems, it causes our vanilla chai latte with soy and no sugar to go up in price. In fact, a couple of years ago, I had a student who had done his internship at General Foods. General Foods is a producer of, you know those tins, International House of Coffees? And there's one called, you know, French Vanilla. His cost structure, speaking of cost and graphs, overnight, the price of vanilla went from about $50 a metric ton to $500 a metric ton. What happens when your raw materials increase by Let's do the math on that. Ten times. What happens to your cost structure and therefore your margins? Right? And it's interconnected. What happens over there also affects us here. Bulgaria. Anybody heard of the country of Bulgaria? Where's Bulgaria? It's in, it's in East Central Europe. Uh, some people call it the Balkan region. It's in Southeastern Europe, bordered by, anybody? Romania to the north. Serbia to the southwest, south, Greece, Black Sea, and Greece. Bulgaria is about, I don't know, 15 million people. They have a GDP of about 5,000 US dollars per capita. Um, not a particularly rich country. Recently joined the European Union along with Romania. Um, what would happen if Bulgaria, about the size of Ohio, if Bulgaria suddenly disappeared into the Black Sea, who would care? The French? Why would the French care? Say it louder. 60% of the world's rose oil comes from the Danube River Valley in northern Bulgaria. What happens to all of us men? The, the day of Mother's Day or the day of our wife's birthday when we have forgotten to buy something and we have to run out to the store. We've got to buy perfume. What would we do, men? We'd be in trouble. We'd be in the doghouse. Right? So we have this notion of interconnectedness. We have costs and benefits and profit margins and everything. Okay? This is part of globalization. This is what our world economy is all about. And for some, it raises a lot of controversy. And that's today, this morning's topic. Let's start first with a very simple definition. Was ist das? Что это? Qu'est-ce que c'est? What is globalization? In your own words, what's globalization? Bye-bye. Yes? Yeah. It's about movement, right? And some would say it's movement, particularly across borders, right? And it's unfettered movement in a lot of ways, right? It's, it's, um, it's not respecting those borders. And what's crossing the borders? Let's have another list there. What did Jill, you said? Yeah, Money's crossing borders. Information's crossing borders. People. Cultural ideas, people. Languages are crossing borders. Culture, diseases are crossing borders, right? Globalization is this new interconnectedness, right? But I like to define it, and in fact, The Economist magazine, which is the magazine you must subscribe to right now, forget about The Wall Street Journal, forget about, forget about Business Week or Time magazine. Rubbish. Throw them in the junk pile, right? It's The Economist. The Economist is the greatest magazine. Get your libraries to subscribe to it right now. If you're going to be teaching globalization, you must have The Economist magazine. The Economist defines, def defines globalization um, with respect to this idea of crossing borders. It's about crossing borders. Globalization is a sexy topic. No doubt about it. And it's not just a sexy topic because we're in a global recession, which is because of globalization, there's a global recession, right? What happened in the United States affected everybody else. But it's a sexy topic because it's here and it's here to stay and it's been here for a long time. 
In 2002, almost 3,000 uh, articles and 600 books. Clearly, this is a topic which a lot of people are talking about. Globalization, according to globalizationguide.org, primarily an economic phenomenon, right? Involving the increasing interaction, inter, inter, uh, integration, cross-border of stuff. Money, people, diseases, wars, language, foods, music, cultural artifacts. This is one definition. Similarly, emphasizing this notion of denationalization. This is particularly important if you're teaching this in economics, but with a political economy or a political slant. You know those boundaries we call borders, right? 49th parallel between Canada and the United States. Those are on a piece of paper called a map. Globalization does re not respect those borders very well. Globalization is kind of this power, if you will, a power to cross those borders without respecting them. Right, swine flu outbreak. Remember the swine flu outbreak a month ago? Did it respect borders? Right, people jumped on a plane. People walked across the border. At least between Canada and the United States, they walked across the border. Okay? Those are very economics and politics oriented. I'll give you a couple of other definitions which reflect a slightly different take on globalization because it's not just about money and it's not just about the borders. We're also seeing social, cultural, technological exchange. We are seeing globalization in terms of time and space. These are two other dimensions which I particularly like to explore. To give you an example, today is Tuesday. Last weekend I went to Greece. I'm going to say that again and think about that. Last weekend I went to Greece. Not I went to Greece for three weeks on vacation. I went to Greece for a weekend. Sociologists love to point out that globalization, technology has led us to a world where you can jump on a plane, O'Hare, or for me, DTW, Detroit Metropolitan, on a Thursday evening and be in Greece on Friday morning, teach Friday afternoon, teach all day Friday, and come home on Sunday. I went to Greece for the weekend. Now, Lauren is busily Facebooking right now. See, you can see her. She's Facebooking. And she's chitty chatting on Facebook with whom? <laughs> she's Facebooking with one of her Facebook pals who lives in Indonesia, on the other side of the world, in a in a twelve hour time difference, right? Sociology's like Sociologists like to emphasize this notion of decoupling of space and time. Globalization means we don't have temporal or spatial limits. I suppose that ties in with this idea of no boundaries also. So, another sociologist, transformation of spatial, social transactions. to change the way we are and who we are. So again, primarily an economic phenomenon about the cross-border flow of, Jill said, money, goods, ships plying the oceans, bringing us crap from wherever, right? Which we buy with American dollars, which then instantaneously get wired to other places of the world, right? Buy perfume, which was designed by Kenzo, who is a Japanese des fashion designer, but who lives in Paris. They produce the perfume in France on a bottle made from silica, which comes from the Middle East, on a bottle produced in, um, in Hungary and shipped by a Greek shipping company to a port in the United States owned by a company from Dubai, gets on a train owned by a Canadian company, which ships it to 
um, Chicago where it goes into a warehouse owned by a Hong Kong company and it ends up on our shelves in Macy's and we buy it with American dollars and put it in a HSBC which is owned by Hong Kong Shanghai based company. That's globalization. Clearly the boundaries are not respected. We cross borders seemingly um, seamlessly, seemingly seamlessly, and the time and the space we don't even think about anymore. Right? It's just a big world. Nobody thinks about Hong Kong as being exotic or strange or far away now. Next week I'm going to Latvia for the weekend. Teach at the Stockholm School of Economics for a weekend. The week after that I'm going to Peru. Right? Then I'm going to Shanghai in August. There's just no spatial boundaries or temporal boundaries. Now, this sounds all pretty good so far, doesn't it? Or are some people's backs getting up a little bit? Seems, seems reasonable. I want to state very clearly that definitions are value-laden. Within a definition, there are clearly clear signs of the person's stance on globalization. So I'll give you a couple of additional... Okay. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, I was reacting right away when you talked about Madagascar producing 70% of the world. You know what, if I'm not mistaken, it's also the second poorest country in the world. In which case, this idea that specialization is going to make you wealthy and everybody will move along to kind of define the system of here. Oh, yes, although specialization is not in and of itself the wealth generation. It's specialization at something which is high value added. So digging stuff out of the ground or pulling stuff out of the ocean or chopping things down, generally speaking, are not very high value added. Right? Canada chops down a lot of trees. Right? We supply a lot of softwood lumber to the United States and then the United States government slaps big tariffs on us. Right? a little sore point with Canadians. But chopping down trees is not very high value added, nor is growing silkworms and pulling the silk out of the, out of the cocoons, nor is, well, there's only one thing which, or a couple of things which make a lot of money coming out of the ground. It's black and it's liquid. Oil, shiny and, and blings, and a few other things, right? But generally speaking, um, the actual extraction of the land-based industries, agriculture, not particularly high value added, generally speaking. So it's not just specialization, it's specialization at higher value added. There are lots of people who are against globalization and clearly these next two definitions will make you feel that. It's a worldwide drive toward a globalized economic system dominated by supranational corporate trade and banking institutions that are not accountable to democratic processes or national governments. Coming to a theater near you. This is clearly a definition written with, I'm not sure an ax to grind is the appropriate phrase, but it's clear that the people who wrote this believe that there's something bad about globalization. That the breaking down of the boundaries means that governments no longer have the power to control and to regulate. You talked about the, the or, uh, you had some presentations yesterday on the economic crisis. What happened in the economic crisis using this definition? Nobody was watching the banks and what they were doing. Nobody was watching these banks like Citigroup and AIG, these big monstrous organizations, supranational corporate trade and banking institutions. Nobody was watching them. And what happened? They invested in stuff which had very, very, very high risk. And high risk is a good thing in the sense that if you win, you make lots of money. But if you lose, you equally lose lots of money and then globalization, this this interconnectedness, which Jill suggested, means that the whole house of cards came tumbling down, including governments like Iceland and Latvia. 
one of my favorite places to go, Latvia, right now. Um, the Latvian lat, they're talking about devaluing the Latvian lat. The Latvian lat, very clever, the Latvians, right? Latvian lat, couldn't come up with a better currency title. <laughs> the Latvian lat is linked to the euro. All Latvians have their mortgages denominated in euros, but they have to pay in lat. What happens if tomorrow the Latvian lat is worth half its value against the euro? Your 200,000 euro mortgage now is going to cost you twice as much. You're going to have to pay twice as much for the same house. Yikes, with a capital Y, right? Here's another one. Globalization is the hegemony of American values. This was a European definition. This is the idea that Globalization is being dictated by Washington. It's called the Washington Consensus, that there are these powerful men and women sitting in the star chamber in, in Washington, D.C., pulling the globalization strings. There's a fabulous book, if you want to read it. It was um, Some people claim it's fiction. Other people claim it's nonfiction. It's called The Diary of an Economic Hitman. And the author tells us that he was a CIA agent in the 1970s and 80s, operating in Central and South America. And rather than killing off uh, dictators in Central and South America, his job was to be an economic hitman. He was the instrument of the American government, he's saying, controlling the economies of Central and South America. For whose benefit? the oil companies or the big corporations, according to this kind of definition. Okay. So clearly, clearly this thing called globalization raises a lot of hackles, right? People find this a controversial topic. Here's the big question. Why? Why is it so controversial? Jill? pointed out some interesting stuff. They make 70% of the world's vanilla, but they're one of the five poorest countries in the world. What's going on with that? Central African Republic yesterday on NPR, one of the poorest countries of the world, right? But they've got stuff which we're using. They've got bauxite and nickel and a bit of gold and some diamonds, stuff which all the poor, all the the developed countries want, right? We need copper. China needs copper. Why does China need copper? To build stuff, right? Wiring, copper piping. Why do you think abandoned houses right now in the United States have no wiring and copper pipe in them? Because people go in there and strip them down and sell it because the copper prices are so high. But why is the Central African Republic the second poorest country in the world? I pointed to you because I saw your head nodding as if you'd heard NPR article yesterday. Well, let's have our debate. If indeed globalization is so controversial, why? Why are people so for or against it? What are the, the things driving this debate? So, you ready? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, Two, one. You're a one? Okay. Hang on. You're a one. Ones and twos. You know who you are? I'm going to put a number between, not between one and two. I'm going to put one or two behind my back. You choose, and if you get it correct, then you can choose if you're going to be for globalization or against globalization. You ready? Number one or two? So, twos get to choose. Do you, want to cho do you want to be for globalization in the debate or against globalization? <laughs> Peanut gallery wants against. Quick, 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 quick. Against? All the twos are against. All the fours are pro-globalization. You have five minutes. Five minutes to develop your arguments for or against globalization, and probably, if you know debate, 
you're also going to want to create the arguments against the things which the other people are going to say. So, debate. Let's do a let's do a, a Letterman, a Dave's top ten fours and a Dave's top ten against here. If I were running this in my classroom, what I would do is I would randomly select one of the tables to present on behalf of the for argument. Then I would randomly select one of the against, and then I would break them back out, allowing for another three to five minutes of rebuttal arguments. Right. So I would do two rounds of it. Again, selecting randomly so that you ensure that one of the random groups which had to present the first time is still motivated to continue into the second time. Make sense? Okay, so here we go. Let's just, just for our own debate here, let's come up with 10, 10 fours and 10 against. So let's start with a four. Are you a four? Four. Let's give us one here. Give us four. So globalization, we see it leads to competition. We, we, we love competition in the United States. Competition is what we're all about, which might explain the idea, that, negative, uh, that negative definition that it's the hegemony of American values. There's nowhere in the world which loves competition more than Americans, right? All you have to do is watch CBC. Canadian broadcasting coverage of an Olympics versus NBC coverage of the Olympics, and you'll get a completely different feel of the Olympics, right? If an American is not in the medal contention, you will not see that sport on television because Americans love to win, right? They love the competition. And every Olympic athlete in the United States was born like fatherless and motherless and came out of, right, they grew up with one leg shorter than the other and miraculously it grew and worked hard and ultimately they win the gold medal, right? Americans love competition. Competition spread throughout the globe is supposed to lead to, our argument for globalization is it leads to higher quality because competition drives innovation. Right, it drives it up and up and up and up. Remember 20 years ago when you only got fresh ground pepper on your pasta at, at, uh, at uh, Olive Garden? Now what do you get? Fresh ground pepper, freshly grated Parmesan cheese, all-you-can-eat salad, all-you-can-eat bread. Right? What's next? You have to watch advertisements and you get your dinner for free. So it's like pop-ups, right? Innovation drives quality up and at the same time it's supposed to drive supposed to drive our prices down. What else does it do? More opportunities. It's supposed to provide people with more opportunities. It's supposed to be about meritocracy. It's supposed to get rid of um, um, nepotism and corruption. These will be the four arguments. Let's have an against argument. Dave's top ten list. What's an against? Doesn't, it doesn't have to be the rebuttal against that. Just any negative. Okay, so, so there's a very popular, um, very popular book, series of books right now, a common phrase is this notion that the world of six billion people is a pyramid. And the bottom, depending on which book you read, suggests that the bottom one billion live on less than a dollar a day. Some people say it's the bottom two billion live on less than one dollar per day, according to the United Nations one dollar a day poverty level. Real dumb. So, argument is not that you're quoting them. <laughs> that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. That globalization has largely neglected the bottom billion. They have not participated in, nor have they benefited from the activities of globalization. And that they're worse off. And the middle four billion here, not doing so well either. Good. We can come back to rebuttals. Let's do a number two here. Two, 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 four. 
Yeah, we'll worry about them in a second. Let's just get a bunch out on the table. Living standards. Living standards are rising globally. A rising tide raises all boats. So we're kind of rebutting at the same time. Even the bottom billion there, their boat is going up. Give us an against. Were you an against? You weren't participating. You're a four. Give us another four. Great. Globalization, the boundaries come down, the borders come down. We start to share, we start to hug each other, we start to understand each other. We start to buy each other's junk, interdependence. And, and what uh, Kenichi Ome, Kenichi Ome, famous uh, Japanese uh, professor said, we live in an interlinked economy, the ILE. We're interconnected and therefore we wouldn't want to go to war. We would, at, from a purely um, self-interested perspective, uh, perspective. We don't want to go to war because they buy our junk and we buy their junk. We're interlinked. On a more human humanitarian level, we like each other. We understand each other. We share, we share some commonalities. We understand each other better than we did before because of globalization. Against human Did I hear human rights before? Okay, we got human rights. Globalization is leading to more respect of human rights around the world? Oh, you're against. Sorry, let's hear it. Yes? Globalization is a pressure like water running down a hill. Companies are forced to drive down their cost structure, so they will go to the cheapest labor. They will go, they will, they will go to places which have the lowest levels of regulation on ecology, on humanitarian level. It's the race to the bottom. It's like water running down a hill. Excellent against. Four. It increases our economic choice. 1993, I was teaching in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, the first Masters of Business Administration program in Central Asia. I'm standing in class. We're talking about this idea of consumers and how they have choice. And I said, you know when you go into your grocery store and you, you, know, you have an entire aisle of bread, you know, you have rye bread and pumpernickel bread and whole wheat, five grain, seven grain, nine grain. You know, you just have the whole aisle. And they looked at me, just completely dumbfounded. I said, you know, the aisle in the grocery store. And they said, we only have bread. Yeah, of course, bread. Kleb. No, we have bread. We have one kind of bread and one kind of non. Non round, flat bread, lavash in Russian. And I said, you mean you don't have choice? No, yes, we can have bread or we can have non. <laughs> Globalization leads us to economic choice. We can choose from a variety of products on any given product. You want a t-shirt? Go into Target. What do you have? One t-shirt? Oh, no, 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 no many different types of t-shirts, which is linked in with this idea of competition. It's supposed to drive up the quality and drive down the price. It's supposed to. Great. Against. Makes us more vulnerable. How? Perfect. The interlinkedness, the ILE, the interlinked economy, it makes us more vulnerable. We are held hostage to 
we cannot avoid the swine flu in the United States. Remember when we were all sitting with bated breath wondering when's the first case going to be in our state or in our city, right? Which country is going to topple next uh, because they bought into dodgy mortgage-backed securities? And also the, the uh, court, uh, moved towards the special thing There was a time when we could do all the stuff ourselves. There was a time when you personally could cook your own food. And how many men here know how to sew, for example? How many women here know how to sew? <laughs> I tried, but I was bad. There was a t how, many, how many men or women here know how to make preserves, how to can something? The old mason jars, you've got to boil them in the big pot to, to sterilize them. You put the rubber rings on the top. How many know how to do that? There was a time when we knew how to do stuff. We are so specialized in our lives, in our economic lives now. Right? We can't do it. We can't do it. Four. I was going to say specialization. Specialization? Okay, specialization. Look at that. Specialization leads to what? Higher quality, lower prices, more efficiency. More efficiency means, means less waste, means better for the economy, means people doing the stuff which they love. Gross national happiness goes up, GNH, right? I just made that one up. Okay, let's, let's do some rebuttals or some additional. We've got about five minutes so we can finish up here. You would have to, as the, the instructor, you might think of how you would run this. I normally do the debate for a 90-minute college-level lecture, right? I do the whole 90 minutes because we, d we do breakout and then we do this. Each group gets to present and then we do breakout again for rebuttals and then we break again and then we do a classroom base. By the way, th we don't just do it based on our own knowledge. I assign readings and I've given you those readings. I gave you about eight. I would usually give, for an MBA class, I would usually give somewhere between 15 and 20 newspaper articles, small readings, and they come to class prepared for the debate, with the prepared in the sense that they have the, the um, right, they have the, what's the word I'm looking for, the, the data, the artillery is ready to, to go, okay? An alternative might be, you could say, give them nothing and say, you're four, now on Wednesday, you're four, that means you've got to go do the research on your own. So self-directed research as opposed to me giving them. Give us another one. Yes. Oh, the ecology. For or against, where am I putting it? Ecology. Why? Race to the bottom again, right? Hey, you know, America has very high EPA standards, right? So why don't... Hey, let's go down to Mexico. We can just dump our dioxins right into the, into the river. Save some money. Avoid all the hassle. Even if, even if a government worker comes and does one of these, right, I'll, I'll overlook it. We just pay that. We're done. Which has also a result of causing more uh, unemployment here. Can we do the rebuttal on the ecology over here? What's the rebuttal? that it's, it's the developed nations, the multinationals, which are, taking, are involved in globalization, they bring higher labor quality, labor standards. They bring higher safety standards. They bring their ecological EPA standards from home to the foreign countries. They help clean up. That's the rebuttal. <laughs> Not in the readings which I gave you, but I can find you readings where it's pro where it showed to be true. The interlinking can also be spun the other way. Let's put on our spin hats, right? Spin it the other way. Interlinkedness is good. When a drug is developed by Pfizer in the United States, do they hold it in Pfizer in the United States or do they launch it, launch it worldwide? If they can make money, they launch it worldwide. 
When uh, three years ago, when Da Vinci Code was launched here in the United States, I was in Zagreb, and the night it was launched, actually, I was ahead of you. It was launched in America. I was watching Da Vinci of Code. <laughs> da Vinci of Code in Zagreb, Croatia. I saw it the day it was released. The interlinkedness means that technology spreads, best practices spreads, ecological practices spreads by that argument. This is, these are not, okay, I'm not, I'm not putting up a flag here, right? I'm just saying by that argument. Let's go, another one. So in the 1970s, for example, the United States developed a law called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the FCPA, which prevents by law, any American firm paying a bribe in, to a government official in any other country of the world. This was in the 1970s, okay? Only in the last 10 years have any other countries adopted that kind of practice. And indeed, you have an American company going up against an Italian company in a foreign country for a contract. The Italian country, the Italian company can claim on the balance sheet bribery as a cost of doing business. In the United States, you get thrown in jail and a $10 million fine for each act to the company for bribing. In Italy, it's perfectly okay to do it, and you can claim it as a cost of doing business. Tax write-off. <laughs> so the playing field, the uniformity is not there in terms of application. Do you have a receipt for that bribe? Uh, no. <laughs> the, the, same, the same lack of uniformity uh, undercuts the competition argument because competition assumes Competition um, is supposed to, at least according to the Victorian England definition of competition, which was adopted by the United States in its sports, you're supposed to have two teams with this neutral arbiter and completely objective, well-defined rules. But our current state of globalization means that you have, for example, some would argue China not playing by the rules because it's undervaluing its currency, thereby making its exports very, very attractive. Hence the reason we have junk in Walmart, which costs nothing. Or, what did I see the other day? Old Navy with $2 um, tank tops. $2 tank tops on the weekend at Old Navy. How can they make it for that cheap? in Bangladesh and then ship it over here all that way and still make money doing it. Something's funny about the rules. More, more, more. Yes, John. Regarding the ecological argument again, um, actually there's a whole new uh, um, work world now uh, developing, you know, uh, NGOs and cleanup groups. Uh, there's a whole part of the economy that's new, cleaning up some of this. So it's a new opportunity then. So it's a good thing. Yes. It, it opens up opportunity. It increases our market size. If we're a company, now our market is no longer Illinois. It is the world. Right. Yes? Um, also, if you look at the floor size, yeah? all of these words that we have up here, competition, choice, I don't know either. Standards. All those operate under a really heavy assumption of what the value of those things are, um, that they are sort of intrinsically good things, um, which those are Western in value. Well, can I, can, I sub, can I stop you there? Human rights, largely Western um, developed concept. No, it's not debatable. Human rights is a, is a, is a, is a Western developed concept. So I could make the same argument over there. Both sides are value-laden. Both sides make assumptions. Both sides assume that health is a basic human right. Or, and certainly on the against side, they hold that one very, very true. Take it one step further, too. Okay. Um, if we're going to look at global data and development, we're also making the assumption that uh, the value of the Oh, 
I'll give, you, I'll give you the opposite argument, that the NGOs, who are mostly on the against side, are imposing development on countries that globalization allows people to choose if they want to participate or not. Is that the argument you were making? Oh, okay. okay. That's an argument. Yes? But I, would, I would argue for globalization increases philanthropy as well. I mean, you have like Grameen Bank, Muhammad Yunus, Keep is a good one, Acumen Fund, all of these philanthropic. That, 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 that globalization is increasing the level of philanthropy and the level of aid and help to raise people out of poverty, to, to improve standards of living. People are choosing. Micro lending, I mean, and helping against human rights violations. Uh, Amnesty International, what a great organization with, for, for at least opening the world's eyes to what's happening around the world. A major impact of globalization is the recent uh, situation with NASA not being able to launch its last spacecraft. Now they are able to buy into former, uh, they, are, they are allied with Russia being able to rent space on the spacecraft yes. back to the uh, space center. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a good thing. Good thing. Now you don't have to put out, we don't have to pay the taxes to buy a new space. You can rent it. That's right. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Well, NGOs are, are funded in many different ways. So traditionally, they're funded by this. But that's because we're trying to tax them and all that. Well, and there's another one of those non-uniformity of rules. Why one reason why philanthropy is so common in the United States is that we have a tax system which allows you to offset your taxes by giving. Not, not all countries have that. In fact, the, the small minority of countries allow allow for tax write-offs in philanthropy. There are also tax regulations with respect to um, non-governmental organizations, not-for-profits. If they earn money through activities by offering services or, or other kinds of products, if they have to pay taxes on those things. In the United States, for example, if you earn, you must earn less than 10% of your overall not-for-profit budget before you must start paying taxes on earnings from a, a profitable business. So Girl Scouts, for example, when they sell Girl Guide cookies every year, Girl Scout cookies, Girl Guides are in Canada, Girl, Girl Scout cookies, they, um, they are now at the point they make so much money on those cookies they have to pay taxes. <laughs> this is a, a burgeoning, burgeoning field, you might have heard of it, it's called social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship is the starting of a for-profit organization under a not-for-profit umbrella where the profit, the residual income, is funneled back into the mission-driven organization. This is why museums have gift shops or Goodwill runs a store, right? The mission of Goodwill is not to run a store. The mission of Goodwill is to rehabilitate drug addicts and former um, prisoners. And they do so through various activities, but in order to get the money, instead of begging for it at the government level or from you and me, they try to generate their own income. That's called a social entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity. Sir? Are the NGOs favored in the rest of the world besides the United States? It, do you know the expression ça dépend? Do you know the French? The French, the French, they are such philosophers, huh? The French philosophize about everything, including it's a nice day out today, right? We would answer, yes, yes the French would go, uh, ça dépend, hein? It means it depends. <laughs> so one expression in French you must learn, ça dépend. But you have to throw some shoulders in and a little bit of a guttural thing, uh, ça dépend, hein? <laughs> so the answer is, it depends. In some countries, NGO world does not exist. In Finland, I, had a, I tried to do a service learning project in a, in, a, in a class in Finland at the Helsinki School of Economics where I used to teach. The, the, the students just said, 
what, what, what's this all about? What are we doing? Oh, well, we're setting up a not-for-profit company to help poor people in Finland. Why? That's the role of the government. That's why, they, that's why we pay 55% taxes every year, because the government takes care of us. We don't have to have a not-for-profit. So there's a cultural effect there. There's also a regulatory effect. NGOs are more or less popular. With the rise of philanthropy, though, has been a rise of xenophobia. We were talking about the attacks on the Romanians in Belfast. Yes. Yes. So that would be contrary to the idea that more people are willing to understand and more open to people who are different than them. We, we seem to have a rise in xenophobia right now. We have, a, uh, we have a rise of nationalism. Contrary to one of the arguments for globalization, there is definitely a rise of nationalism. The question is, does the nationalism arise because of globalization? Or has globalization, has globalization helped it, abated it? Um, some argue that, that nationalism is less about the culture class the Huntington cult, uh, cultural, cl cultural clash, but more because of economics. That when you're poor, you're much more susceptible to being drafted into an extremist group. Which suggests that if you want to bomb a country and you want them to jump onto your side, you might want to consider economic development as your main tool of getting them to like you. We can go on, right? So, who won the debate? Four? Four? Who, who has four? Against? Looks like we're tied. Who wins the debate in globalization? This is, this is part of the lecture. This is part of the discussion with your students. Who wins the debate? Who wins? Well, what's the what's the correct question? I guess how can we work within Nobody wins the debate. Nobody wins the debate. The controversy is there. It always has been it will probably continue for some time. How can we change the current system? Is this, is this uh, I was, we were talking at this group, is globalization as defined here, is it perfect? There's another, maybe that's another avenue of discussion. Maybe you say, it's a form of globalization which has not perfected itself yet. It's not fair in many ways. The rules are not uniform. If you're a full-on Ayn Randian kind of, you know, um, libertarian capitalist, you would say globalization is the only moral system, but it's not perfected yet. It hasn't allowed, it, it, it doesn't allow for perfect competition yet. It's not completely fair. We have not eliminated all of the barriers. Globalization is still evolving towards an ideal globalization. That can be one form of the discussion. Another form of the discussion your name is? Where's your badge? In which grade do you teach? Uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Okay. So another, another avenue of the discussion is we've got a current system. How can we work within it to address some of the world's most significant problems? Where else can we go with the discussion? So you don't want to stop at the debate. Right, you want to keep it going. We could uh, discuss social justice and corporate social responsibility. Social justice, great discussion. Corporate social responsibility, which is going to get into another debate because we have two broad debates there, two broad sides. One is that you can call it the matriarchal or the patriarchal kind of form of CSR, which means the company has a role, motherly, fatherly like, to make decisions on behalf of society. Then you have the libertarian view, which is the only moral thing to do is maximize shareholder profit. And in doing so, it will find the correct path because the society will penalize you if you don't. They would argue over here that it's not that you're being 
um, patronizing, you're being culturally insensitive, you're being all those negative things, if you choose what's best for society, let society choose. If they don't like the way you are acting, then they will penalize you by boycotting your product. Now, does, does our current form of globalization provide all the information necessary for people to make that choice? Are people rational, <laughs> rational beasts who always follow the information? Are they motivated to collect all the information? Whenever you walk into a grocery store, do you look up all those companies? You look on the label and it says, this is a green company and they've got the stamp of approval. Do you know that that company is actually um, greenwashing? They're owned by Procter & Gamble, for example. And you, Do you know that? And are people motivated to do that? So that's another interesting discussion. Where do we go from there? How much say do, do people have in their own economic development? How much do they want to participate in globalization? At which level will make them happy? Right? The Kingdom of Bhutan, for example, the King of Bhutan, his, um, he doesn't want to participate in globalization. He wants the world to stay away. He's tried to boycott satellite dishes and radio and television. Right? Everybody would reach nirvana through um, self-meditation. Kevin. Speaking of the, the long historical context of relationship between the West and the non-West, and it's been uh, a pretty imbalanced relationship. Yes. And to, to uh, kind of proceed forward, ignorant of that, or to be pretty forward mindful of that, you can't help but think that this new equality is going to be perpetuated. Yes. That, that it's going to be the Washington consensus, the traditional, you know, since the 1800s, this country that will benefit the most, and the rest of the world will tag along and hope that things will get better, but definitely not. Yes. And we have a very short sense of history in the United States and Canada, right? The world started in 1775 here and in 1867 in Canada, right? And the fact that for, for 500, 800 years, Europe, Western Europe, which is supposedly the cradle of modern civilization, right, was in the Dark Ages and it was places like Mesopotamia, you know, you know where Mesopotamia is? Iraq. Mesopotamia developed the modern legal system. And then a few years ago, America strutted in there, bombed the heck out of them, and said, we're going to bring you a legal system to get your country in order, right? So we have a very... And Canadian, Canada participated in that also, so I'm not just pointing the finger at Americans. We have a very short sense of history, and I think this is good. We need to contextualize a lot of these discussions, right? Copernicus. Right? We, we revere Copernicus as about, about the solar system. No, it was Ulugbek in, uh, in, in Samarkand in Uzbekistan, which was not Uzbekistan at the time. It was the, it was the uh, Khanate of Bukhara in Central Asia in the 1300s who built the first observatory and measured the distance to the, distance to the moon in the 1300s, well before Copernicus in the Renaissance period. Right, Mathematics, linguistics, Central Asia, Middle East, we have a very, very skewed sense of history. And we have a very short sense of history. Tear it down. Build something new. Great. Great point. I want to leave you with a final, uh, a final few ideas, the dimensions of globalization, which I tend to emphasize, bearing in mind that I teach in a business school where we are talking about globalization in an economics and business context. If you are teaching it more within a social studies class or a civics political introduction to political science, you might lead it in a slightly different direction. Then we ought to have time for some questions here. For me, globalization, at least in the business world, again, that little fine print, are four major dimensions I would like to highlight. The first, it's clearly for us the confluence of several important economic phenomena. Okay? The current, globalized, gl current system of globalization, it's liberalization and deregulation. We've seen that particularly since two leaders in the early 1980s. Anybody know who was leading the free world in the 1980s? Ronnie and Maggie, right? <laughs> Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher, they were the two who jumped on the liber libertarian kind of um, conservative economic policy, liberalization and deregulation. But that 
that's when globalization did a little inflection point where it really took off, okay? Um, privatization of assets. More and more governments around the world have been getting rid of their assets, except in the last six months, where there has been, to some degree, nationalization, but it really, I wouldn't call it a straight-up nationalization. I would call it governmental investment or taxpayer investment, which is a, which is a, different, it's a different mentality. It looks the same, but it, but it is different. A retreat of state functions, especially in the United States, the government is doing less and less for us in our daily lives. Health care, education could be a big one to go, maybe, right? Privatization of education, privatization of orphanages, privatization of lots of things which used to be done by the government. In Finland, yes, the government still does everything for us. Diffusion of technology, cross-national distribution and production. We talked about that. Jill gave that example at the beginning. Integration of capital markets. So these are just some of these phenomena, economic phenomena, which have come to a confluence, come to, come to a head in what we would call globalization. The second thing, somebody, I can't remember who it was, said to me, but globalization just, it just didn't happen in the last few years. It's been around forever. Indeed, it is an evolutionary process. Right? In the good Darwinian sense of the word evolution, it started from a big bang. Um, and I just put up some really, really interesting periods in the history of globalization, which if you can close your eyes and imagine what it must have been like for you as a person at this time, it would be like, be incredible. Imagine, for example, if you lived at a time when the entire world decided to adopt the Gregorian calendar that overnight you stopped using the Jewish calendar or the Thai calendar or the old Chinese calendar or the Julian calendar. Imagine when the world got together and said, we're going to have the same postal and telegraphy um, standards. It's incredible. These things we take for granted, you know, texting, right? Lauren over there texting in her pocket while she's MySpacing at the same time. I guess it would be MySpace. Facebook's for young kids, right? Fall of the Berlin Wall. What an, anybody, it's one of those kind of JFK questions. Where were you when the Berlin Wall came down, right? What a momentous occasion in, in, in world history. And, and the integration of about 30 countries which had been isolated for approximately 70 years. Okay? Number three. C'est clair, hein? Ça dépend, hein? It involves everyone. Globalization involves, or at minimum, impacts everyone. There are many countries, not many, there are some countries which have decided, for whichever reason, to not participate in globalization, and look what's happened to them. North Korea, right? We're talking about it. It's hot on, on the tip of, tips of everybody's tongue these days. Cuba has to some degree not participated, Myanmar, right, Laos, Cambodia, there are degrees of involvement, but, and we must not forget all these different players, you and me as consumers, governments, companies, financial institutions, not NGOs, the international organizations, unions, everybody is impacted, involved, everybody's a stakeholder of globalization how you want to participate, how you want to try to change the world through your participation, it depends on where you sit there. The final thing, just to highlight what we've done here, it is controversial. And when I'm teaching my MBA students, I, I say, I give them the answer, nobody wins the debate. Nobody wins the debate. You need to understand both sides of the debate. When I lived in St. Louis, St. Louis has about, I don't know, 10 Fortune 500 companies, one of which is Monsanto. Anybody know Monsanto? The world's largest genetically modified organism organization, right? Every day, you, you want to go to their campus? You want to know what their campus is? You'd think it'd be this lush, rolling green hills, like park-like setting. Yes, except for the barbed wire fence around it and people at the gates every day with big placards manifesting. Right? Every day at Monsanto, people are out there manifesting. You want to go work for Monsanto, you need to understand the debate. The debate is there. 
it's not just once a year when the G7 meets or the, G, the G9 meets or the G11. It's not once a year um, at the WTO meetings. It's every day at the Monsantos of the world, at the Coca-Cola subsidiaries in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, where I did some consulting work. It's every place which has a presence in globalization, you will find this debate. You need to understand it. Okay? And the controversy runs the gamut. We, had, we, we came up with our top ten list here or more. There are many, 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 many different um, dimensions on this, on this controversy. Well, I think we touched on all of these. Well, except for the destroying cultural differences. But that pretty much captures many of our, many of our issues. The four, the four dimensions I think are most important to re recognize, it's globalization is largely, at least from a business school perspective, the confluence of a series of economic phenomena. Number two, it is evolving and will continue to evolve. Number three, it involves everybody. It impacts everybody. And number four, there is controversy. So what now? What do you want to know? What are you going to do in your classes? What can I answer? What? We have five? We have two minutes. I got the two minute nod. Perhaps the envisioning of what may happen in the next couple of centuries, how globalization will be complete. Okay, some things, I think some things we need to, to, to look at. Um, convergence of currencies. There are fewer currencies than there are countries in the world. So I think we're going to see a lot more convergence on the currencies. That's one thing. I would suggest that we're also going to see more, more um, I don't know if consolidation of countries is the appropriate way to say it, but there will be consolidation of trade regions. We've got the European Union, we've got NAFTA, there's talk of a FTA, free trade of the America, free trade agreement of the Americas, which would go from Canada all the way to Tierra del Fuego. That would be a huge trade group. And then, of course, they'll start talking to the European Union, and the next thing you know is you have your transatlantic trade group, at which point boundaries will really mean nothing. They will be on a map, but they will mean less and less. So we'll see a lot more convergence. I think we will see harmonization, and we've seen it in lots of different standards. Right now, we're talking about the banking regulatory, the SEC kind of regulatory, and it's going to be global in nature. We saw accounting standards. It's called the uh, GAAP, generally accepted, uh, generally accepted Accounting Principles, GAAP. Those um, went into force, and I think 150 out of the 196 countries of the world follow the same accounting principles. So we're starting to see convergence on a lot of sort of pan-national things. So I would keep an eye on those. Those are some, some hot, hot topics. Lots of technological convergence um, around software, around standards on DVD players and MP3 players, on IEEE. IEEE standards on USB cables. It's incredible how, you know, 30 years ago we couldn't agree on Betamax or, or VHS, but today, you know, we're having a lot more, more agreement on certain technological standards. That America might finally adopt the metric system. <laughs> there are only two countries in the world which are officially not adopted the metric system. They are America and Bhutan. Bhutan. <clears throat> Americans might stop calling it the military clock and just call it the clock because everybody around the world uses 24 hours instead of two, two um, half days of 12 hours. They might finally start writing the day before the month. <laughs> questions? Other questions? We need to wrap this up. We, we can talk at break, no problem, and I'm here for the remainder of the day. Any more questions? Any questions? Preguntas, por favor. Yes. Will there be more regulation also in terms of social Regulation. Regulation is one of those words which these days in this political climate raises a lot of hackles also, as if regulation is in and of itself a bad thing. 
Again, going back to the sports analogy, Americans love competition. They love sports. You cannot have sport if you don't have rules. Right? Even playground basketball, which Obama loves to play, there are these generally accepted playground basketball rules. If you don't have those rules, you cannot play the game. Otherwise, it's just throwing a ball around. So I think, yes, there will continue to be regulations. I'm hoping, inshallah, I'm hoping that the regulations are far more sensible. And I think, unfortunately, we have a political process with lobby groups and all the rest of it. I think if we had a benevolent dictator every once in a while, it might be good to come up with some much more sensible rules. But um, I think we could also get rid of the power of the lobby, lobbyists in the United States, but that's, that's a different story. I'm obviously taking a side on some of these issues. I wouldn't commit over here, but we've got to take a break. Thank you very much. <laughs>